Would you bow your heads with me? I want to begin with prayer this morning. Yahweh, Yahweh, Jesus, our Lord, Holy Spirit, thank you for the joy and privilege of worshiping you together as part of your great family and as part of this church family. I want to pause this morning to pray for Pastor Jeff and his family. I pray that you would be his good shepherd, that you would lead him beside still waters, that you would restore his soul and give him your peace and your rest. And Lord, we pray that you will lead us as your church, and by your spirit, teach us to trust, protect our hearts with your peace, guide us with truth and grace. And now it's with open and humble hearts that we invite you to teach us from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, most of you may remember that I spent uh, many of my growing up years in a small town about 40 miles north of New York City. So small, in fact, that if you didn't know New York City was 40 miles away, you would never have guessed in a million years. In many ways, I had kind of an idyllic childhood. I went to school with the same kids from fourth grade till we graduated from high school together. And in the little neighborhood where we lived that whole time, there were five or six other boys about my age. And so every day after school or uh, every day during the summer, as I recall it, my younger brother Joe and I would head off into the neighborhood to play sports at some kind at one of our friend's house. In the spring and summer, we played baseball at one friend's house because he had a backyard that would allow us to do that. In the fall, we played football at another friend's house because he had a nice side yard that was flat and level. Then in the wintertime, we went sledding behind yet another friend's house because he had a hill and we could have a lot of fun doing that. But no matter where we were, no matter what championship game we were playing with our friends, there was one constant in our childhood, and that was my dad's whistle. It's whistled. Today, kids and parents have cell phones and smart watches by which they can text and stay in communication. But then, those days, we just had my dad's whistle. Somewhere along the line in his life, he had learned this amazing ability to whistle. I mean, really loud. Now, someone here might have that talent. Can anybody here whistle like that? If you can, can you do it right now? As loud as you can. All right, that was good. Last night, somebody tried it at uh, Mill Creek, and they were nervous, and they couldn't get anything to come out. But that whistle right there, my dad could do it. He didn't stick his fingers in his mouth. He just had the ability to purse his lips and somehow force so much air. It was loud and shrill. It was amazing to me, almost magical, partly because I could never learn to do it myself. I just couldn't get anything to come out. And because it was loud and had this distinctive pitch and tone, the same every time. So our dad's whistle was so unique that my brother and I could hear it, recognize it anywhere in our neighborhood. Now our neighborhood probably not as big as I remember it, but it seemed like it was half a mile away, we could hear that whistle. And some of you may know I lost my dad just a year and a half ago, yet somewhere in my deepest memories, I can hear that whistle to this day. We're in this third week of a series we've called Unrecognized King. We're looking at seven stories, most of them out of John's gospel, that take us all the way up to Easter weekend. And in each story, we're seeing that Jesus makes a claim about himself, something about his identity, his authority, his purpose. And in each story, someone or a group of people fail to recognize him. We began a couple of weeks ago in John chapter 6 with the feeding of the 5,000, which was actually more than 5,000. It was just 5,000 men, John tells us, let alone the women and children. And Jesus said at that instance, I am the bread of life. In other words, using physical hunger to teach about spiritual hunger. And then in John chapter 8, we read, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And that statement sparked uh, an angry argument between Jesus and a group called the Pharisees. And in the middle of that dispute, Jesus says this, very truly I tell you, before Abraham was born, I am. At this, they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. Now, why would they suddenly try to stone him to death. Well, when Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am, he is taking the holy name of God that we just sung about, Yahweh, and applying it to himself. And the Pharisees were students of God's law, and they knew immediately what he was doing and what he was saying, and to them this was 
blasphemy. So they pick up stones to kill him. But somehow Jesus escapes uh, that effort. Then in John 9, Jesus repeats, I am the light of the world. And then he heals a man born blind. That was the subject for last Sunday. And he does so on the Sabbath, comparing physical blindness to spiritual blindness. And that event props on yet another confrontation where the Pharisees accused Jesus of being a sinner because he has healed on the Sabbath, which was a violation of their idea of Sabbath law. And then Jesus tells them that they are actually the real blind men in the story. And then the Pharisees throw the formerly blind men out who Jesus has healed, and they make him an outcast in his own community. Jesus goes and finds the man who then recognizes Jesus as Messiah and comes to faith. And all that sets the stage for what we read today. John chapter 10, we're going to cover the first 21 verses. So I'm going to read a bit and then teach a bit, and we'll work our way through this passage. John 10, verse 1, Jesus is speaking. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. I want to pause after that first verse because we can miss something here that the Pharisees that he's speaking to would immediately understand. Remember, this is right after the story of the blind man when they have cast him out of the synagogue, cast him out and made him him, uh, unwanted in his community. The image of a shepherd was one of the most recognizable and respected images in the history of Israel. First, because God himself is referred to as a shepherd. Psalm 80 says, hear us, shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock. Isaiah 40, the prophet says, he, the Lord God, tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. And in the well-known and well-loved Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, and your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, what you also may not know is that the image of a shepherd was also applied to those God had put in place to lead and shepherd his people, Israel. And when those shepherds fail to lead faithfully and with righteousness and justice, God speaks to them through the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel 34, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, woe to you, shepherds of Israel, who only take care of yourselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You eat the curds, clothe yourselves with wool, and slaughter the choice animals, but you do not take care of the flock. You have not strengthened the weak, or healed the sick, or bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strays, or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally." As I said, the Pharisees were students of the scriptures. They knew Ezekiel 34. So when Jesus says, very truly I tell you Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way as a thief and a robber, they knew what he was saying. He was pointing his finger directly at them as unfaithful shepherds. He's saying, you who just cast out the man that I healed out of my grace and love, you who are called to shepherd my people, have become thieves and robbers. So you can feel the tension ratcheting up in this conversation. Now back to our passage in John 10, verse 2. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand, and that word can mean receive or accept what he was telling them. So the first thing we see here is that the good shepherd knows his sheep. The good shepherd knows his sheep. Now, before we can talk more about the good shepherd, we need to talk a little bit about sheep. Anyone here today grow up around sheep, grow up on a farm, know much about sheep? Okay, a few of you, and you may be able to correct me in between services if I get something wrong here. 
Uh, at the time in which Jesus is teaching here in that culture, everyone knew what sheep and shepherds were like. Everyone knew it was a common part of their lives. They knew what that relationship was like. My only real experience with sheep has come, you know, at petting zoos or the few times when my wife and I took our, our boys to a pastor's retreat center in rural Illinois, uh, kind of a gentleman's farm. There were homes and barns and a bunch of animals out in the fields, horses, cattle, goats, a donkey, a llama, and a bunch of sheep. And over several visits to that ranch, I made my own unscientific observations about sheep, and, and here they are. From a distance, sheep are cute and cuddly looking, like that, like the ones you count before you go to sleep. But up close, their wool is coarse and tangled, often with, matted with mud and even their own dung. They're actually kind of ugly up close. Sheep are also jumpy and fearful. We could approach the other animals at the ranch and get close enough to almost touch them, but you move toward the sheep and they would scurry off as if they were terrified. Sheep also don't appear to be the most intelligent of creatures. For example, uh, there's no sound in this little video, but just keep your eye on the sheep that is stuck in the ditch. Uh, go ahead and show this. <laughs> Pastor Andrew found that little clip this week and showed it to me and made me laugh out loud. But then the more I thought about it, it became, you know, slightly uncomfortable because I realized that sometimes that's what I can look like. Get rescued out of the ditch and a few steps later, you tumble right back in the same ditch. Uh, sheep are also have sort of limited perspective. They said most of their lives looking down at the ground. And if there's grass right down in front of them, they eat it. If there's no grass, they just stare at the dirt. Uh, their perspective is, is extremely limited. Now, having made those brief observations, listen to Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us. We are his. We are his people the sheep of his pasture. You see that? God compares us to sheep. Now, how might we be like sheep? Well, most of us look pretty good from a distance, especially on Sunday morning. But up close, sometimes a little bit different story. We too tend to be jumpy and fearful. The pandemic of recent years only exaggerated the growing anxiety in our culture. We too have a kind of limited perspective. We spend most of our lives looking at that little patch of ground in front of us. You know, we, we sleep, we work, we eat, we sleep, we work, we eat, we do it all over again day after day. We too tend to fall in a ditch at times. And when rescued, sometimes we jump right back in. Jesus says the good shepherd knows his sheep. Verse three, he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. I want to ask you to do something that might feel a little strange this morning. On the count of three, I'd like you to say your own name out loud. All right, you with me? All right, ready? One, two, three. Has it ever dawned on you that Jesus knows you by that name? Isaiah 43 says, but now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. This means that God doesn't just know us in some sort of general sense. Jesus does, doesn't know what human beings are sort of in a general sense. Like I know a few things about sheep. He knows us personally, individually, by name. Listen to Psalm 139. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. He knows what we look like up close. He knows what makes us anxious and afraid. He knows our perspective is so often limited by our own needs, our own desires, and our selfishness. He knows sometimes we fall in the ditch. And get this, he isn't repelled. He isn't disgusted. Verse four, when he has brought out all his own, 
He goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. He knows and he loves us as his own. And not only does the good shepherd know his sheep, his sheep also know him because they recognize his voice. How many of you have now or have ever had a pet dog living in your home, family? How many dog owners? Okay, well, you will recognize this little illustration. It doesn't take long for a dog, depending on the breed, to learn and recognize your voice if that dog lives with you. Now, I have no, no idea about cats. Um, we've never had cats. I have a son now married to a, a, his wife who has a cat, so he's now a, a, lives with a cat. But we were with them recently, and it seems to me that when you call to a cat, they look at you like, you talking to me? Have your people call my people, and I'll see if I'm free. You know, that's the feeling I get from a cat. I don't know if that's true or not. We had a Labrador retriever for about 10 years, and if I said sit or stay, she would sit or stay as long as I told her to. But if somebody else walked in the house, someone they didn't rec- she didn't recognize and said sit or stay, she would disregard their command because she did not recognize their voice. And sheep evidently are the same way. They may not be the most intelligent or resourceful of creatures, but they do have the capacity to recognize the shepherd's voice. In Jesus' day, each shepherd had a unique kind of call, uh, kind of a, a yodeling, kind of sing-songy call that the sheep would come to recognize as their shepherd's call. And so the flock would hear, recognize, and follow their shepherd. The good shepherd, Jesus says, knows his sheep and his sheep know him. Secondly, we see that the good shepherd provides for his sheep. The good shepherd provides. Now, as a father, uh, over the years, one of my greatest pleasures was uh, providing for my children. And now as a grandfather, one of my greatest pleasures is to see my sons now providing for their children Now, one of the most obvious ways a father or mother uh, provides for children is by providing food, shelter, and clothing. By providing a home, for example, a secure place to live, clothing that protects from the elements, and food, which is nourishment for their growing bodies. And when our four boys were all younger, living all at home, it seemed that to us that in the morning, when they woke up, the first thing they would say would be, I'm hungry. After school, when they got home, What they would say is, I'm hungry. And at night, right before they went to bed, the last thing they would say is, I'm hungry. In fact, to this day, uh, our oldest son, who was 33, was just in town this weekend. He's he's married with a one-year-old son of his own. He he comes home. He did it this weekend. He walks into the house, greets us, and walks straight to the refrigerator. He opens it up and just stands and stares, scanning for anything that might be left over that he can devour because he's still hungry. And I smile because, in a way, I'm still providing. This is one of the roles of the shepherd. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall not need anything. He makes me lie down in green pastures where I can feed. He leads me beside still waters. This is what Jesus is saying. Verse 7, therefore, Jesus said again, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. Jesus is saying that as the good shepherd, he provides three things. First, security. Now, many cultural historians believe that there were two basic kinds of sheep pens, sheepfolds in Jesus' day in the Middle East. In the villages where bunches of people lived, there were, the sheep were often kept in kind of a large pen uh, with walls and then a gate that could be closed and secured and locked like this. The walls were higher and there was a gate that could be closed and locked. Uh, and the multiple flocks were kept in one of these village pens and then the shepherds could leave them there overnight, go to their homes and they would leave a hired person just in charge to watch. And then the next day, if they were gonna take them out to the fields to graze, the shepherds would just use their call, their sheep would recognize their call and follow them out into the fields. But once they were in the countryside needing to stay overnight, the shepherds would create a kind of temporary pen like this one using stones and a few sticks with an opening 
not with a, uh, with a wooden gate. And the shepherd himself would sit or lie down in that opening as if he were the gate, the door, protecting that sheep pen. And many scholars think Jesus is referring to both kinds of these sheep pens in this teaching. He says, I am the gate for the sheep. Whoever enters through me will be saved, will have security. Sheep are vulnerable animals. They don't have claws or fangs with which to protect themselves. They're vulnerable to predators. They need a shepherd's protection and safety. The shepherd provides that safety by making himself the gate or the door for the sheep. The good shepherd also provides nourishment. He's, Jesus says they will come in and go out and find pasture. Sheep need to be led. If left of themselves, they'll eat the grass right down to the dirt. So the shepherd has to lead them to greener pastures where there's fresh grass so they don't destroy all the pasture land. He leads them to water so they can drink. The shepherd provides nourishment. Jesus says not just physical nourishment, but nourishment for our souls as well. And thirdly, the good shepherd provides life, he says, life. Verse 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. Now the word translated to the full here just means greater, excessive, beyond what is expected in quality and quantity. Other translations read abundantly or more abundantly. I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Now, this doesn't mean that the sheep will never have trouble. Uh, They will still tend to get lost. They will still face dangerous predators. But if they follow the shepherd's voice, he will provide and protect and offer life. And that's true for us too. In John 16, a few chapters later, Jesus says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble But take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus is saying that we are like sheep. We need nourishment, we need protection, we need guidance. And when we fall into the ditch, we need to be rescued. And we have a good shepherd, and when we follow his voice, we will have life. Fullness of life now, abundant life, and eternal life later. The good shepherd comes to provide life. That leads to the third point today, and that is the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Now, what does Jesus mean by the wolf? What's that image about? Some say he's still talking about the unfaithful shepherds, the Pharisees, who he's speaking to. Some say he's talking more about Satan here, the great enemy, the one who kills and destroys. And there's debate about that. But I think we can simply understand it to be that Jesus is talking about the enemy of the sheep the predator of the sheep, and that enemy is sin and death. He's saying that when the wolf comes to attack the sheep, the hired man will run away, but the good shepherd knows and loves and owns the sheep, and he will lay down his life for the sheep. Now, that little word for is important in this text. In the original language, it means on behalf of or in place of. Now, they couldn't have understood what he was talking about then, but we have the New Testament. We have the whole story, so we can understand. Jesus is pointing as to how this increasingly contentious and even hostile story is going to end with the sacrificial death of the shepherd for the sheep. More on that in just a moment. Verse 14 Jesus repeats, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Now what does he mean by 
other sheep. Now he's talking about the non-Jewish world, the Gentile world, the ones that many of the Jewish people considered as outsiders, those considered unworthy of the love and grace of God. And that's all of us. Unless you're here today and you have Jewish background, you're a Gentile. We are the other sheep Jesus is talking about. Remember, Jesus here is speaking to Pharisees who believed that salvation or the grace of God belonged only to the chosen people because of their Jewish bloodlines, because of the covenant of the law of Moses. By definition, Gentiles were excluded, but they had forgotten God's promise to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 when he says, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. All peoples. Jesus is saying that salvation is through him as the good shepherd and that his kingdom would be extended far beyond the people of Israel to all who would believe, which means that we, you, were on his mind right here, along with any that you think might be outside of the reach of God's grace. Verse 17, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority, power, to lay it down and the authority, power, to take it up again. This command I received from my father. Now, if you're tracking right now, somewhere inside you, you should be going, wow. The little hairs in the back of your neck should stand up. He knows that they're already some of them thinking of killing him. They picked up stones once to try to stone him as a blasphemer. But he says, no, 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 that's not the way this is gonna happen. You are not going to take my life from me. All this will happen by my authority. I have the authority to lay it down. And I have the authority to take it up again. Now he's pointing here to the cross and then to the resurrection. And we're gonna get there in a few weeks. But Jesus is saying, all this is going to happen on my terms in obedience to my Father's will. I will lay my life down to defeat the wolf of sin and death. And then I will take it up again. Verse 19. The Jews who heard these words were again divided. Many of them said, he is demon-possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? But... Others said, these are not the sayings of man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? So Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I am the gate. I came to give life. I'd lay my, down, my life down for the sheep. And then there are different responses. There are those who fail to recognize him, who fail to acknowledge him, who, rec who, who reject him saying, he's got to be demon possessed. He's raving mad. Don't listen to him. But notice, there were also some of these same Pharisees who were beginning to wonder. They were beginning to ask, well, wait a second. Could a demon-possessed man really open the eyes of a man born blind? Maybe, just maybe, he is who he says he is. Back to my dad's whistle just for a moment. When my brother and I would hear that whistle just wafting through the air in our neighborhood and whatever's home, whatever boy's friend's home we were at, we could hear it pretty much anywhere. When we'd hear it, we'd stop. Didn't matter if we're in the middle of an at-bat, an important game, or we're running for a touchdown with the ball, we would stop and we'd listen. One of us would say, did you hear it? Did you hear it? Was that him? And we'd hear it again and we'd say, yep, and we would go. Drop the bat, drop the ball, and go. Because that whistle meant it was time to go home. The whistle meant it was that we had a home to go to with a mom and a dad and a baby brother and a table set with food, a place where we were known by name, where we were loved, a place where we belonged, where we had life. My dad's whistle was his voice calling us home. We recognized it, we trusted it, and we followed it. Jesus is the good shepherd who calls to his sheep, who calls 
you by name. He calls me by name. He has a voice we can recognize and learn to hear. And his voice leads us to abundant life now and forever. So, listen hard and listen well and come home. We're going to close with the bread and cup of the Lord's table. And as we do that, just two things I want to say. First, the bread and cup do not belong to Chapel Street. They belong to the Lord, so you don't have to be a member of this church to take communion. You just need to have put your faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. If that's true, just please join us. But secondly, I want to say this. Because the bread and cup belong to Jesus, it is for those who belong to Jesus. So I just want to invite anyone here this morning who is not yet sure of your relationship to Jesus. Maybe you've not yet responded personally to the call of the Good Shepherd. And today you sense that he's speaking to you by name. I just want to encourage you, before we get to bread and cup, to say yes to him in your heart of hearts. Just say in your, in your heart, pray. I believe you are who you say you are. And I believe I am who you say I am. And I need you to be my good shepherd, to forgive my sin, to make me your child, to give me the promise of life. And if that's you, if that's the desire of your heart, then you too join us with great joy and take bread and cup. Let's bow in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for this beautiful image of the good shepherd. And as we come to the bread and cup, we confess that we are indeed like sheep. We need a shepherd. We need to be known. We need to be loved. We need to be rescued. We need life. Remind us again through bread and cup that only in you can we receive abundant and eternal life. Amen. Turn the cup over and just peel off the small section that reveals the, the wafer. Scripture tells us that on the night before he died, Jesus met with his closest followers at a Passover meal. At some point, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave each one a piece. He said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this remembrance of him. Turn the cup over and peel off the larger side where the juice is. After the bread, Jesus also poured a cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sin. The apostle Paul reminds us that as followers of Jesus, each time we drink this cup, we proclaim his death until he comes again. Do this remembrance of him. Just before the benediction, I want to remind you that if you'd like to spend a few moments in private prayer or with one of our prayer team members, the glass room on that side of the lobby is set aside for that purpose. And if you're newer to Chapel Street, uh, we have a connection time this morning out by the connection banner. I'll be out there along with some other members of our staff. We'd, be, we'd love to meet you and greet you by name out there. So join us if you can. Receive now today's benediction, Hebrews 13. Now may the God of peace who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Have a great day.